All right, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to stand in front of the podium instead of behind it. What do you think? Great. All right, um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Marika. I'm from Portland, Oregon, and I'm really stoked to be here at DevOps Days Columbus. Um, I'm going to be talking about on-premises software delivery. First, a little bit about myself. I am currently the DevOps manager at Powell's Books in Portland. Powell's is the largest independent bookstore in the United States. I also volunteer with the PDX Women in Tech organization, uh, where I uh, participate in their Speakers Bureau. Outside of work, I am um, an avid uh, advocate for earthquake emergency preparedness. Some of you may be aware that Portland is in the Cascadia subduction zone, and so I volunteer with the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management. I also uh, participate in an Estonian folk dancing troupe, and I love to read, so working at Powell's Books is really awesome for me. Uh, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you a story. So this is a story about a smallish tech company in Portland, Oregon that I previously worked at, and how uh, while I was there, we went from having really painful on-premises software delivery, like once uh, every six months or so, to releasing on-prem software as a routine thing and with ease. So a little bit about this uh, tech company. It was about 150 to 200 employees. Um, we made requirements, test, and risk management software used by uh, companies and um, folks in highly regulated industries, such as the automotive industry, medical devices, semiconductors, and aeronautics and space. So from the... Uh, origin, like the, um, the start of the company, about you know, 10 to 12 years ago at this point, uh, this software had been delivered to both cloud and on-prem customers and was delivered as a you know, Java web app. So we essentially delivered a monolithic .war artifact to, um, to both our cloud hosting um, you know, provider that, that then our, our cloud customers accessed, and we gave that same war to our on-prem customers. And, um, you know, before you say anything, like, I, I want to defend this decision because 10, 12 years ago, it made perfect sense, right? We didn't over-engineer our solution. Our customers loved it. It was just a single artifact. They could install it on whatever, you know, web server they wanted. And at least at the time, uh, we were able to vertically scale our application um, to meet the majority of the use cases of our cloud customers. And so it paid the bills, it wasn't overcomplicated, and, you know, that was a good decision at the time. However, fast forward to about four years ago, um, you know, we were in a situation where uh, we were only, although we were shipping to our cloud customers once a month, we were only testing uh, and shipping our on-prem version of this software once every six months. And as you can imagine, it was a very waterfall process where we would wait until the very end of that six-month cycle to, uh, you know, test everything, put together, put things into the on-prem packaging. Um, inevitably we would run into issues during the hardening and testing phase. There would be this massive like call to arms and the whole engineering team would have to rush to the fire and brute force this on-prem release across the line. And it was exhausting and nobody liked on-prem releases. Additionally, about four years ago, uh, we started to see that our cloud usage uh, was was starting to like our cloud architecture the dot war the monolithic dot war in our in our cloud was not going to be able to support the types of users and types of use cases that we wanted to go 
more and get more of. So like enterprise customers in the cloud, we're, gonna, we're pushing the limits of what our vertically scaling application could handle. So the decision was made that we needed to re-architect our cloud software to support horizontal scaling. And the business required us to continue to deliver an on-prem version of our software at the same time. All right, so before I go too much further, I wanna make sure we have a common set of definitions. When I say cloud, what I mean is SaaS, and that is that the software vendor, so in this case, the company that I was working for, we um, built and delivered software that then we put onto you know, a, a cloud provider, and our customers accessed that software via a internet connection and paid for it using a, you know, via an annual or maybe monthly subscription, they didn't have to install anything on their hardware in order to use our software. When I say on-prem, what I mean is that we as the software vendor packaged up our entire software solution and delivered it to our customers who then installed it on their own hardware had to manage monitoring, upgrades, like all the stuff that comes with, you know, installing software on your own systems. So, my first piece of advice is to avoid on-prem if you can. And the reason is because it is really, really expensive uh, to support a dual deployment model. It's expensive in terms of time. So it is, if, you're, if you are a SaaS company, um, planning to now offer an on-prem option, you should estimate that it's going to at least double the amount of time that it takes to develop and test any new addition to, you know, any new feature that you want to deliver. You also have to factor in the amount of time it's going to take to backport every, like, critical defect fix to every single fully supported version of your software. And that is a um, non trivial amount of time. It's also expensive in terms of people. So depending on how you decide to go about supporting this dual deployment model, you might end up actually having to double the size of your engineering team. And even if you don't do that, you are absolutely going to have to hire a world-class customer support organization because on-prem customers just need more customer support. It's also expensive in terms of technology because you can't cost optimize your infrastructure, your deployment tooling, your um, kind of support stuff uh, for either deployment model. And so you kind of end up in this middle space that isn't optimized for either. Uh, and unfortunately, you do end up carrying around more tech debt than you might otherwise uh, be carrying around. All right, so even though it is expensive, there may be some reasons that you cannot avoid uh, shipping an on-prem option. And one of those reasons might be that you are going after a um, user base or a market that cannot use your software in the cloud. An example of this type of customer is a customer in a highly regulated industry that um, needs to manage their own upgrade schedule. Uh, you know, these customers may be putting their intellectual property into your software. And due to the uh, regulations of the industry that they are operating in, they need to prove to their auditors that the data integrity of their intellectual property is maintained after every upgrade of your software. And so on, on their part, what this means is they have to stand up a sandbox environment, do a test upgrade, and run their data integrity tests, and have a, you know, um, test the rollback and, and disaster recovery process. And obviously this is a very manual and expensive process, and the customer cannot afford to do this more than once every year, perhaps, even if, if even that frequently. And they certainly cannot consume your cloud releases on the accelerated timeline that, that you're shipping those. Another type of customer that might not be able to use your software in the cloud is a customer that is just 
paranoid about security. And uh, believe it or not, the semiconductor industry is an example of this type of industry uh, where um, any or any leak of their intellectual property could spell complete disaster for, for their company. And so they are just really, really adamant about needing to have their intellectual property completely in their control. Uh, and so, so those customers cannot or won't uh, trust their data in the cloud, at least not yet. Another type of customer that um, can't use your software in the cloud may be a defense contractor that needs to use your software in an air-gapped configuration. And um, what, what this means is, is that, for instance, a, a defense contractor might need to use your software in something called a SCIF, which is a sensitive compartmented information facility, which is essentially a steel uh, bunker that you need security clearance in order to enter. And, you, and inside, they have computers that you know, you can install software onto, but those computers don't have any internet connectivity with the rest of the world. So clearly, those customers can't use your software in the cloud. Okay, there is another reason you might not be able to avoid on-prem, and that is that you may be a small or a struggling startup that's really strapped for cash, and a really big customer comes along and promises to pay you a lot of money if you offer them an on-prem option. And so at that point, it becomes a business decision. Okay, so let's say that you're now in this situation where you have decided as a, uh, your cloud so, you know, software provider, you've made the decision to offer an on-prem option. Here are some things to consider. Where do you bifurcate? So you can decide to actually bifurcate your source code and have one version of your source code that is more cloud native and another version of your source code that is more um, relevant or more easy to deploy to on-prem customers. And in fact, um, at, the, at last year's AWS reInvent conference, Atlassian actually gave a talk where they described that they bifurcated the JIRA code base and they now have a cloud native version of Jira and a, like enterprise on-prem version of Jira. So, so that is an option. They went on, however, to describe that in order to do this, they literally had to split their engineering team in two and they now have a completely different product backlog for their cloud and for their on-prem um, options and so really what they have done is they have split Jira into two completely different products and not that that's a bad thing but that's expensive right and so that is something to consider if you decide not to bifurcate your code base and instead are committed to shipping the same core code to both your cloud and your on-prem customers then at the very least, you are gonna to have to bifurcate your delivery pipeline at some point so that one end of it delivers to your cloud and the other end of it delivers to your on-prem packaging. Can you do microservices? I'm not gonna lie. Offering an on-prem option does severely limit your architectural choices. Um, and in particular, you probably cannot uh, make a serverless cloud uh, technology a core component of your of your on-prem option because your your customer just can't be won't be able to use it that being said yes you can ship more than one artifact to your on-prem customers that kind of together makes up a working version of your software but can you docker I guess now I should update this to say but can you kubernetes um, I mean, yes, yes, you can, uh, but you need to think about the process or the experience that your uh, on-prem user is going to have installing this, uh, this software. And so, you know, if you're shipping maybe a collection of Docker containers to your on-prem customers and you're like, here, here is my application, it's the core thing and a bunch of supporting services, right? How's your customer going to know how to correctly like get get the correct images and stand them up and connect them correctly and um, okay so maybe then you're thinking 
well, we could ship some type of installation uh, software, right? Or an installation wizard. But now what you've done is you've, you've created another on-prem software, which is the installation wizard, which has its own like bugs and needs to have its own backlog of stuff, needs to be fully supported in all these different environments. And so um, you need to be aware of that as well. How many different uh, environments are you going to fully support your software running on? And um, in particular, uh, if you support the world, then you're going to be stuck in testing the world for so long that um, you're not going to be able to deliver your software to customers fast enough. So you have to limit yourself to which operating systems you're going to support, which um, databases you're going to support. And every time you remove an operating system from your list of fully supported environments, you're going to lose customers. So like, if you decide we're not going to support Windows, like there is a whole category of on-prem customers that just cannot use your software in that case. And then finally, how are you going to ensure that you can hotfix a on-prem release that is you know, 12 months, 18 months, maybe two years old. And so this is where very rigorous release management practices are gonna be really helpful so that you know exactly what it was that you shipped two years ago. And um, when you fix that critical security defect, you're only fixing that and you're not shipping your customer anything that they didn't sign up for. Um, one thing that we found is that versioning the definition of our build pipeline together with the code that it built, made sure that we were actually able to go back and actually rebuild that two-year-old software as well. My second piece of advice. If you cannot avoid on-prem, at least limit complexity. So at the company that I was talking to you about, uh, you know, four years ago when we made the decision that we were going to be um, going to a more horizontally scalable architecture in the cloud, but also needing to support on-prem at the same time, we made the commitment that we were going to not bifurcate our code base, but to ship the same core code to both our cloud and our on-prem customers. And we did this for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we wanted to ensure a high level of quality. And so anytime we would you know, fix a bug in the core code, we knew that that bug fix would go to all of our customers and we didn't have to worry about like cherry picking it across these two different code bases and merging back and forth. Um, and we, the second reason we made that decision is because we wanted to reuse as much as possible our existing engineering team. And so the way that we did this was by using Docker. So uh, we shipped six Docker containers uh, to our on-prem customers that kind of together made up a working version of our software. The core monolithic app, um, together with a search service, um, an Elasticsearch container, an OAuth container, uh, and then a couple more containers that tailored the multi-tenanted cloud logic for a single tenanted install. Now in the cloud, we did have additional Docker containers running for things like monitoring and message queues, but our, our application was entirely capable of running in the absence of those as well. So we shipped these Docker containers to our customers using a third party tool called Replicated. So Replicated is a, is, a, is a tool that essentially allows software vendors to deliver their cloud native applications to customers uh, who can install it behind their own firewall and essentially on their own systems. And there are a couple of different ways to use Replicated, but this is how we use it. So our customers went ahead and downloaded the admin console, the replicated admin console onto the hardware that they were anticipating that they were going to use to run our software. And, um, and that included the licenses for our software as well. And then what Replicated did was it ran a series of pre-flight checks. 
Uh, it checked that the operating system was a fully supported operating system. It checked the system resources. It checked like the version of Docker that was installed on that system. And essentially what this do does was it uh, made uh, a whole category of support issues just disappear for us because we knew that before the customer even tried to run our software, it was running on hardware that was fully supported. On our side, what we would do is our build automation packaged up the Docker images that made up a working version of our software together with a configuration file and pushed that up to Replicated's private Docker registry. Replicated operates using this concept called channels. And so essentially every time we would push up a new version of our software to the replicated registry, uh, it would pop up as a new build on the internal channel, essentially. And so that was a channel that our internal QA and dev teams could subscribe to and they could see those new builds and pull them down and test them. And um, only when we were ready, we felt that a build was stable and ready enough for a customer to see, we could then promote that exact same package to the production channel. And so that was a very, that was a nearly instantaneous process um, whereby the existing package that was already there was just now made visible on the production channel. When that happened, the customer uh, back in their admin console now saw a new version of our software pop up. And all they had to do to, to upgrade was click this install button. And then Replicated did the hard work of pulling down the correct Docker images, uh, installing them, and uh, spinning them up and configuring them according to that configuration file that, that came along with that package. And so from the user's perspective, it was really, really simple and very straightforward. Uh, Replicated also supports a air gap install. And so for customers that need to use our software in an air gapped environment, they can download a special package um, onto an external drive and take it into a, an air gapped environment and install it onto those computers without needing to use an internet connection. Uh, Replicated also supports a certain amount of horizontal scalability. And so for instance, some of our larger on-prem customers were able to uh, configure their Elasticsearch containers in a um, clustered configuration so that um, uh, they could improve their search performance. And so Replicated uh, supports this out of the box. So um, deciding to have a single shared code base that both our cloud and on-prem customers both um, received uh, and leveraging a on-prem container orchestration tools such as Replicated, we were able to greatly simplify the process of having a dual deployment model. At the same time, it was still very expensive for us to ship to both cloud and on-prem. And in particular, we had to employ a full-time professional services engineer whose primary job it was to kind of guide on-prem customers through the initial installation and upgrade process. Because honestly, some of our on-prem customers um, were unfamiliar with the operating system that we were requiring them to use in order to run our software. My third piece of advice. If you do support an on-prem option, treat it like a first-class citizen. So four years ago, when we were only building and shipping our on-prem releases once every six months. Um, we did this because we you know, considered it an afterthought. And uh, obviously that led to a lot of pain, a lot of disruption for our engineering teams. And so you know, when we moved to this new model, we committed to the DevOps maxim that if it's painful, we're gonna do it more often. And so, um, basically, this is uh, when I left the company early this year, this is where we were at. So at, um, on every commit, this is, so this is an overview of our, at a very high level of what the build pipeline looked like. Uh, every commit was built and uh, packaged and tested 
and uh, on a nightly basis, that code was then uh, packaged into Docker images that were then sh uh, deployed to staging or testing environments that were both in the cloud and the on-prem configuration. We then had nightly uh, performance tests and a whole like suite of functional uh, integration tests run against both environments and uh, we would triage those results the next day. And what this guaranteed us was a couple of things. First, uh, it guaranteed that there was a consistent level of functionality between on-prem and cloud, and that the performance didn't change too significantly from one day to the next. It also ensured that we could trust the results of our automated test suites, because since we were running them so frequently and triaging the results daily, if a test failed, we would either fix the test if it was brittle, or we would go ahead and fix the code that broke it. And then finally, by deploying it daily, uh, we were ensuring the stability and, um, and quality of the pipeline itself. So um, today, the company is practicing continu essentially continuous delivery of on-prem. And so uh, every cloud release is essentially ready to go as an on-prem release, and if the company decided that um, we need to ship the latest cloud release to our on-prem customers right now because there's a feature in there that they need right now, this would be a nearly instantaneous action of just uh, making that already existing package visible on the customer production channel. And, um, and so we have seen great benefits from this. Today, on-prem is routine. And so there are benefits to the customer and also benefits to the vendor. So the benefits to the customer, obviously, are a much higher level of quality uh, because we are building, testing, and deploying our on-prem version of software much more frequently than we used to. Um, we are, are also... Um, uh, ensuring a consistent level of functionality between the two environments. And uh, because we are uh, know that that delivery pipeline is there and that the promotion of an existing cloud release can be made to our on-prem customers nearly instantaneously, the um, delivery is a lot faster as well. To the vendor, so to, to the company where I was working, there were also a lot of benefits, including the fact that uh, teams were no longer disrupted by these on-prem on releases. Uh, on-prem releases were routine, and, um, and teams essentially didn't even notice them anymore. Uh, it, uh, by driving this type of frequent delivery, we also uh, reduced manual toil when it came to software delivery and, uh, and pushed a lot of automation, which then in turn uh, increased repeatability of releases as well. So clearly, um, the journey uh, for the company is not over, but I am really proud of how far we came in the four years um, kind of since that journey began, and I'm really excited to see where they go from here. So to recap, if you're a SaaS company, Avoid offering an on-prem option if you can possibly avoid it. If you can't avoid on-prem, at least try to limit complexity. And one way of doing that is to deliver the same source code to both your cloud and on-prem customers using something like Docker containers, and to leverage a third-party tool uh, to do the on-prem container orchestration for you. And then finally, if you do support an on-prem option, Treat it like a first-class citizen. And with that, I thank you very much. Questions? So replicated wasn't a total magic bullet. Replicated wasn't a total magic bullet? Question mark? No, it was not. Um, there was. Uh, there were definitely customers that struggled with. Um, you know, have getting familiar. So one of the things that, that we decided to do was to limit the operating systems that we supported to, uh, to just like CentOS and Red Hat. And so there were a lot of customers for whom this was a brand new operating system. And so much of our uh, professional services engineers job was essentially walking them through how to be 
a sysadmin for a, for a Linux Linux based system. Um, it did, however, mean that we didn't have to write or maintain the installation wizard part of delivering our Docker images to on-prem, though. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.